would say even but that said, I'm sorry to get that Okay, we're going to get started. So I am happy to have Jim Brady here and introduce my, my old boss in the world former of Legacy boss. TV. Former also boss. Old. Old, old and <laughs> not that much older than me, actually. So uh, my former boss, Jim Brady, who has been... Um, one of the things about Jim that I think has been appreciated by the industry as a whole is how generous over the years he's been about, uh, you know, earlier the foundation people were talking about sharing your successes. Jim has done a lot of sharing his successes and sharing his failures and being transparent about some of the numbers behind what he does. And that's helped so many other people build a game plan. And so we're proud to have Jim. These are, it's a lightning talk format. So these talks are gonna go relatively quickly and then we're gonna leave room for questions and then we're gonna go on to the next person and so on. It's a good presentation, it's just not mine. So, I could try it, it'd be entertaining. But. It's Kenny's fault. Thank you very much. All right, I just want to talk. I know I got seven minutes and I talk fast to begin with, so that'll help. Um, talk a little bit about the philosophy around going into multiple sites. Um, we were in, we were, we are in three cities right now. For those who don't know about Spirited Media, we have three sites. We were founded three years ago. We launched Billy Penn in Philadelphia in 2014, launched the Incline last fall in uh, Pittsburgh, and we merged with a site called Denverite in Denver in March of this year. So we have these three, mar three markets, obviously all very different, even though two of them are in the same state. But, but I want to talk a little bit about the scale piece of this, because I know this always comes up a lot. So, so let's talk local scale. And so I just want to talk through the philosophy of how we roll out different sites, what we think scales, what we think doesn't scale, and how we try to do them differently. So my basic philosophy is you can scale product, you can scale technology. We all use the same WordPress backend, and that's great. You can scale all the administrative tasks of running the company, all the HR tasks, payroll, insurance, and all that. And you can even scale some ideas. We have ideas for events that we use in all three markets and ideas for content series that we use in all three markets. So a good idea can immediately be on other, two other sites the day after you have it. So they're not scalable in the effort of the people, but they're scalable in that it shortcuts the idea of having to come up with the idea. You can just share it. So, but there's things you can. And I think it's important to understand what you can scale. And you can't scale your voice, you can't scale your attitude, you can't scale the relationship with your audience, or even how you cover each individual city. We cover all cities differently. We, we have different beats, and we don't really have beats per se. There are different areas of focus we have in each of the markets, and that's based primarily on what's being covered in those markets already and what isn't. Um, our attitude in going into a market is there are far fewer, whatever market you go into, there are far fewer journalists there than there were five years ago. And so the idea that you're going to be the 10th person at a press conference you know, makes no sense to us. We'd rather be in a, covering a beat that people have either abandoned or have let 
rot pretty badly. So in certain cities we cover, in Pittsburgh, we cover technology very aggressively because the tech scene in Pittsburgh has been the driver of its resurgence. And it's really not covered that much locally, in my opinion. Philadelphia, we don't because Philadelphia has a site called uh, the um, tech, um, my mind is locking up for a second, but uh, thank you. Technically Philly, I don't know what's wrong with my brain right now. And, um, and they do a really good job covering tech, so we don't really do as much tech there. So we try to adapt per city. So you have to be willing to be different where you go. Because each city is different, and they require a unique approach. The voice needs to fit, the attitude needs to fit, and the name needs to fit. And we learned that lesson, the name one, the hard way. So let me give you a little background. Anybody ever heard of this site? Yeah. <laughs> this was actually the original name for Billy Penn. And we went and spent a lot of time looking up a name that we thought would be great for the city. And, you know, outside of, you know, we thought Brotherly was perfect, right? City of Brotherly Love, literally, you know, a perfect fit for the name. Outside of doing business with the Libyan government, which is always a bit risky. Um, we thought it was a pretty good name, but as many smart people have said, there's a fine line between clever and stupid. And it turned out this was stupid. And when we put it out on Twitter and we said, this is our name, everybody, the response to all of, from 90% of the people was, what a great name, it's perfect, it captures the, the city perfectly. There were 10% of the people who absolutely hated the name. Um, in fact, if you went into Philadelphia and said, what percentage of actual Philadelphians liked the name Brotherly, you would get 0.0, .0 not a one. Because their response was like, that's a tourist name for yeah. our city. That's not the net, that's not a name for people who live here. Like brotherly, I mean, we, we say it ironically in Philadelphia, like when we throw a battery at an opposing sports figure, we say, yeah, city of brotherly love. Like we, we, we use air quotes when we say brotherly, so you can't use that name, that name sucks. And it was like, luckily we hadn't launched the site, we hadn't really done anything yet, so brotherly went away. Follow replaced by Billy Penn. Now, everybody who knows Philadelphia knows what Billy Penn refers to specifically Billy Penn. I mean, people get that reference Lee broadly. It's William Penn, but they don't get the specific reference. People who do not, don't know Philly do not know the reference. And that's exactly what we decided to aim for after we blundered the first time around. So how many people here know exactly what Billy Penn refers to in Philadelphia? Very few, right? But if, the, but if you know Philadelphia, you know that it refers to this gentleman who is on top of City Hall, the famous statue on top of the gorgeous City Hall that Philadelphia has. This statue is called Billy Penn. It's of William Penn, but it's called Billy Penn, and so people talk about Philadelphia living under Billy Penn. We thought about under Billy Penn as a name, but it sounded like colonial porn, so we decided <laughs> not to stick with that, and we just decided let's just do Billy Penn. So we just went Billy Penn. So when we went, by then we kind of got the rhythm of this, which is that you want something parochial, you want something that people in that town will sort of feel is theirs, and that if somebody outside that city says, I don't get it, you're like, you're goddamn right you don't get it. You don't know Philadelphia like I know Philadelphia. And so that was how we kind of got to the idea that the sites we have to, the sites that we have need to have that name. So in Pittsburgh, we picked the incline, and the people know what the incline is refers to in Pittsburgh. How many hands are a little bit few or a little more than Billy Penn? They refer to the funicular the railways that go up the sides of hills up Mount Washington, the Duquesne, the Duquesne incline, the Monongahela uh, incline. I might have not said Monongahela right. I'm sorry. I get that one wrong every once in a while. But basically, it's another, and it also the beautiful. The beautiful thing about both names is Billy Penn is up on high and it's, a, it's got elevation and the incline is going upwards and so these things all conveyed what we wanted them to convey but we never wanted to just name them like, give them a name and say blank Pittsburgh, blank Philadelphia, blank Denver because I think that annoys people in cities who feel like my city is unique, it doesn't deserve to just be slapped on to some generic name you've given our city so we've chosen different ones. Now, Knowing that we have a third site called Denverite, you're probably wondering what the hell happened with that one because that doesn't really fit into the theme. Denverite, as I said earlier, we, we acquired or emerged with back in May, and that name was already there. It had been there for nine months, and as much as there was a part of me that's like, I want to find the thing in Denver that's like the incline in Billy Penn, as you guys all know, it's really hard to build a brand. And like to waste nine months of like having this name out there and then trying to pull back and rebrand, we just decided not to do. Um, so we've stuck with Denverite. But the voice thing goes down even to, um, you know, beyond coverage. It gets down to like, what voice do you want to have? So if you're in Philadelphia, you want a voice like this. Right? You want headlines that are funny. You want headlines that are a little sardonic. 
Um, Bull fatally shot trying to escape Philly is definitely my favorite. Bull, on the way to the slaughterhouse, jumped off a truck and ran down the major interstate in the middle of Philadelphia before, sadly, he was shot again. But it was worth the shot, right? He was going to the slaughterhouse, so. Um, but just trying to be a little funny and a little sardonic and a little, a little testy because, you know, if you know Philadelphia, there's, you know, the thing I always, I'm, 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 I'm the worst kind of person for Philadelphians. I'm actually grew up in New York, so that I have to get over the, that when I talk to people there. But the thing in Philly that always amazes me is this sort of sense that Philadelphia, people will say, you don't criticize Philadelphia, that's our job. You know, there's definitely a little bit of beating up on yourself that Philadelphia does in ways that are kind of interesting to me. So we want the tone to be kind of reflective of the kind of city it is and the, you know, we can be a little more profane and we can be funnier and definitely sarcastic. But you go to Pittsburgh and that really quite, doesn't quite work. And if you know, those who know people from Pittsburgh, they, they love, and Scott, I'm looking at Scott Broadbeck, a, a Pittsburgh native, love Pittsburgh and don't really want you to criticize Pittsburgh because they don't even want to criticize Pittsburgh. It's very much a city that people who grew up there love and feel really good about, and it, and it doesn't quite want that F-bomb dropped into headlines. It's a little bit of a different tone. So there, it's a little bit different. And so even where we might take a, you know, we actually do something a little there, so like, you know, high, of course, the classic one is the upper left, where Facebook thinks a lot of people in Pittsburgh are actually in Philadelphia. And that's probably the worst possible thing. Maybe the only thing worse is thinking you're in Cleveland, but because that's the that, well, no, that's more of the rivalry, more of the Pittsburgh rivalry. It's not a shot at Cleveland, but Pittsburgh doesn't care about Philly that much. It cares about Cleveland. Um, but we try to, we, we're, not as, we're not as edgy there. We don't really go for the edgier headlines that are going to potentially alienate part of the audience. We don't take the shots at the Eagles, that, I mean, the Steelers, that we might take at the Eagles. Um, because it's just, there's a certain sense of there, like the Steelers are a community franchise and we don't pick on them. But in, you're supposed to pick on the Eagles and the Phillies and the Flyers and everybody else. So the, here you just see, it's the sense of place. Like if you look at the Bourdain thing in the bottom right, Bourdain's show last week was in Pittsburgh. And there was a lot of chatter about that show and whether it was fair to Pittsburgh, whether it was too harsh on Pittsburgh, whether it was too fawning to Pittsburgh. But the real discussion is people in that town really care how Pittsburgh is viewed outside of Pittsburgh. And a lot of the stories we write kind of focus on that. The bingo thing on the left here is everybody in Pittsburgh is very tired of all the stories about how Pittsburgh is this up-and-coming city and they make the same references in every story about the same 10 things that Pittsburgh is doing that have made Pittsburgh, you know, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Uber self-driving cars. And so when somebody writes the 50th story about how Pittsburgh is the next Brooklyn, that's the joke there, we always will like give this bingo card out to say that this story met 18 of the 20 things on the bingo card. So, so it's a little bit more of a city pride thing, but with a little less edge. And then in Denver, we try, it's a very different, the relationship that Denver created with its staff right from the start, with, from its audience, I'm sorry, is very much a, is a familiar one. They, their newsletter, if you look in the bottom right, that's the newsletter text. I'm excited to see you. Here's what's going on in town. It's signed by the person who wrote the newsletter that day. It's very, it's very much meant to be like this very intimate relationship with the audience and that better, that best reflects sort of the relationship that that, that Denver thinks it needs to have with its audience. So, um, and it's very much, it's very much built for speed and for um, economy so that you can get what you need to get and get out. So there the tone, they don't have as much of a tone at all. Their tone is much more about utility and helping you run your life day to day in Denver. And for me, having three sites that are all a little bit different, not only is the right thing to do because cities are not the same, um, they also give you opportunities to try different things in different markets that you can employ in the other two and hopefully somewhere down the road more than two, the two additional ones. So that's that. Thanks. Okay, we have questions. Kelly, can you grab a microphone on the other side and help me pass my questions? Anything. Did you bring Anybody? <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Brittany Schock. I'm a reporter with Richland Source. We're in Mansfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, um, this, these different tones that you mm -hmm. have, how beneficial is that when you're like talking to your audience? And you know, is it more beneficial to have kind of that colloquial tone when you're talking to people in your audience, or is more of a professional tone better? You know, what are the pros and cons? I think. Well, I mean, I'm. Somewhere between the two. I mean, I think you don't want to be unprofessional, especially when it comes to the actual journalism you're producing. You're not going to throw random accusations out there. About, I mean, you're going to, the journalism has to be bulletproof, but when it comes to how you communicate that with the readers, I think you have to be, 
especially if you're going, and I should have said this earlier, we're going after more of a 40 and under set. So they're used to reading sites that are a little voicier than your average newspaper or local TV station, and so we have to reflect that. So I think if you look at the sites, we also curate probably 20 stories a day from other places in the market. And a lot of days we'll get calls from those other, other media companies saying, like, I wish we could have written the headline you guys wrote when you, when you actually curated it on the homepage. Now, I always feel a need to say, when we, link, when we curate anything, we link straight to whoever produced the story. We don't actually aggregate it, which I think is the difference between the two. But we do have to write our own headline for the homepage, and that headline will try to make as edgy and as interesting as possible, pull an interesting fact out of graph 12. But I think, I, think it's, I think it helps. A big part of our revenue model is events, and I think between having a more accessible voice and people actually meeting you at events and meeting your reporters at events, I feel like they feel like they know you, which I think, I think is really crucial going forward. I think too much of what's happened in, with newspapers is they kind of want to be of the people but not with them. And I think we all have to be with them too. We all have to feel like the people in this community are people we need to know to a person, not as this kind of amorphous thing out there in the distance. And so what we think the voice and the events and other things we do help us get there. Yeah. Doug Rainey, I'm next door in uh, Delaware, where we take an ironic look at Philadelphia from time to time. But um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your coverage of the Amtrak derailment, which I think was really well regarded in the mm -hmm. Philadelphia area, and also whether you could uh, you would think about scaling down to smaller areas like Delaware. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think, I think the, we think the model works, you know, can work anywhere where there's a, a shared experience, I guess is the way I'd say it, is we look really hard at markets that are dense, because I think if you only have like a newsroom of four or five people, you don't, you know, go into a place like, you look at like Dallas or someplace like that, and you think, man, that is a very spread out market. That's over like 50 square miles. Like, we like the Philadelphias and the Pittsburghs and the Denvers, which are relatively dense cities. So I think as long as there's some density and some shared experience, I think the model works. I think if you get into like a suburban area where everybody's living vaguely different lives, it gets a little harder for that shared thing. But on the Amtrak thing, that was our breakout moment when that crash happened uh, on my anniversary, which made that for an unpleasant anniversary. But the Amtrak crash outside of Philadelphia, we, that was when people really got the whole idea of why curation works because everybody was reporting on that crash when it happened and we were advancing the story not by reporting, not by assuming we could report it all out ourselves, but by saying CNN just found this thing out and the Philly Inquirer just found this thing out and we just found this thing out. But having no issue linking to anybody who was advancing that story, I think it showed people like, wait a minute, they did a great job on that Amtrak story because I, I just followed them every day for a week because we were doing stories, what we know, what we don't know, what we still have to figure out, like very, easy to read, kind of follow kind of summaries of where that story was. And I think people realize they do that. They could do that every day for me in the city. They can just highlight the best stories broadly in Philadelphia, not just around this one big breaking news event, but every day. And our traffic from the Amtrak crash on, that was our sort of big break, and that's when it took off, because I think that was the lesson people got, is they're not afraid to link out. Because I still think, I don't know how many people here link out or don't link out, but I know that a lot of local newspapers still don't do it, and I think it's the dumbest thing. It's not, linking out to other papers is not, or other news organizations is not only not a bad idea, it's a way that you actually set yourself up as a place people will start their day because you're willing to link to anything that's interesting, not just your stuff that's interesting, because people pick out pretty clearly when you've locked them out of the broader content space. Uh, yeah, if you could elaborate a little bit um, about curation and how it actually works and how much of a percentage of your news feed um, is involved. I, I, I think that it's a model that a lot of uh, publications um, could make use of. Yeah, I think we probably write 10 stories a day and link out to 20. So we're probably about a third of what we put up is our own and two thirds of it is stuff from other sources. And, and that comes in via lots of, you know, sometimes the staff finds stuff. And one of the ways we do it is we have reporters rotate through that duty so that they, they want, we want them to see what's coming in through all these other you know, RSS feeds and Twitter feeds, because sometimes a good story comes out of them seeing some, something somebody else has written. So we don't want like one person doing curation who sits in a chair all day. We want to rotate it through the actual reporters, but excerpt is what we do, like a line or two. It's not very long. But we put the source on there pretty, you know, we put the source, we rewrite the headline and maybe write a, sub, a subhead, but that's about it. And we try not to you know, we, we try to limit how much we put in there, but we want them to be things that have crossed over a certain threshold. But I think it's a, I think it's a smart model and one that others should, others, many others do it. I'm not saying we're the only one who does it, but a lot of news organizations have, have still act, acting like it's a bad idea to do it, and I don't understand that. Yeah. 
All right, so we got Glenn up here, and I'm sorry to cut off the questions, but hopefully, no Jim, we're on afterwards. I actually want to piggyback off that question. Yeah. Uh, Philly has a new paywall now, I believe. Yeah. Uh, how will that or other paywalls affect your decision to uh, curate? I mean, it's hard because it's not a hard paywall. Some people will be able to get through whatever link you put up and others won't. So I think we might just put a note on there that it's a paid site and depending on whether you have a subscription or not, this link may work for you or may not work for you. But I don't think it'll have, other than noting that it's a paid thing, I don't think it'll have a major, a major, uh, I think it's much easier when it's a paid site like the journal is now. Like you know it's a paid site for everybody. There's no meter or anything like that. But we'll, we'll continue linking to them. We just did an eight part reporting series with the Inquirer um, over the, in the spring about the market, the market Frankfurt line. That was, you know, so we're, we're, we're frenemies I guess. If I, don't, I, don't, I think we're just friends, but, um, but others would may argue that. But, uh, but yeah, we'll still link to anybody if they produce content with things worthy of it. And if it's behind a paywall, we'll probably note that more aggressively. All right, thanks, Jim. All right. So, so our next speaker is a great example of, um, of a dynamic in this building, um, which is there are so many people with like incredibly remarkable careers and backgrounds who have taken an interest in local news and have started local news sites. Just get to know people. You'll meet uh, foreign war correspondents and accomplished journalists and business people who've gotten into it. Um, Alice Drager is an example of that accomplished uh, author and researcher in, in her day job or her night job. I don't know, you know, however you My call it. My former job. Yeah, former the one job. that paid. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, the publisher of East Lansing Info. And uh, we're going to hear about how she has marshaled the community to be involved in that coverage. So thanks for having me. We're a very weird model. And what I've found, I, I've written for places like the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune. And when I started doing this model, and tried talking with national reporters that I know about it, they felt very threatened by it. And so one of the things I want to emphasize today is that the model that we're using, I think, ultimately helps journalists nationwide and ultimately helps for-profit news organizations. I'm not at all against for-profit news organizations. I'm just against news deserts, as we all are here. So that's really my concern. Um, just quick on my background, I have a PhD in history and philosophy of science from Indiana University, which is why you become a local journalist, right? But what happened was um, I was an academic and um, in my own town in East Lansing, I was going to city council meetings and recognizing that there were most of the people in town had no idea what was going on. And that meant that terrible decisions were being made and voters were voting based on who wrapped themselves in a rainbow flag and said they loved unions rather than voting for people who actually were gonna be the best at taking care of the city. So I collaborated with some other local um, citizen watchdogs and we started doing a, a totally non-economic model and then I found that that was not sustainable because I needed somebody to take care of it every day so then I formed a nonprofit organization and that's what we are now. Just three quick anecdotes from the last couple of weeks of how I know we're succeeding. We're in our fourth fiscal year now. Um, <laughs> I was walking home from my son with bagels the other day and uh, I was taking a picture of a pace car which is the parking and code enforcement. It's a branch of the police because I needed a stock photo. You know, when you're a local journalist, you're constantly taking stock photos. So I needed to take a picture and the officer looked at me kind of funny and then pulled around to talk to me. I thought, oh, here we go, right? And he stopped me and he said, are you Alice Drager? And I said, yes. He said, could I be a reporter for you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, the other one was I called the mayor about something that the Lansing State Journal, which rarely but occasionally reports on East Lansing, had said about an East Lansing issue. And the mayor said to me, I have no idea what you're talking about. I only read you in the New York Times. <laughs> and uh, the third one, what was I going to tell you? Oh, I forget what the third one is. But anyway, I've got lots of anecdotes about how it is it feels like we're really succeeding in terms of taking care of the people of East Lansing. We, our motto is we are news of the people, by the people, and for the people of East Lansing. We take very seriously the idea of bringing nonpartisan news to a very one-party town. Are we weird? We are absolutely weird, but I think and my team thinks we are the news future for small cities like ours because of the fact that small cities like ours do not have the economics in many cases to sustain for-profit news. I wish we did, but we don't seem to have that. So it's pretty um, concerning to have a news desert. And what we've had in East Lansing is a situation where we've had to rely on the state news, which is Michigan State University's student journalism publication. They gave up 
pretty much city reporting until recently, until we sort of forced them back into it. And the Lansing State Journal, which is a USA Today paper, and you know what that is like. Um, the LSJ the other day ran a headline that you may have seen that looked local, but was actually a national story that they syndicated, a stranger buys stressed mom at Target a candle. <clears throat> And I said, this is why I founded a news organization, because that's what the LSJ is publishing. So we are citizen reported. We're entirely reader supported. We are a hybrid of volunteers and paid staff. I don't get paid. I run the organization. I do government reporting, and I uh, edit the government section. But my managing editor is paid, and most of our reporters now get paid something for what they're doing. So we've had over 100 citizen reporters, ranging in age from third grade. She had help from her mom to octogenarians. Um, a lot of the folks who report for us are underemployed stay-at-home parents, and a lot of the folks uh, are people who, just for whatever reason, have an interest in providing service to the community and also have the time to do so. What we find is that we are a classic local community public service organization. That is to say, it is mostly women doing mostly the work and doing it for almost no money. And historically speaking, that is what public service organizations at the local level have been, and that is what we are. Um, the picture over here is actually our summer youth journalism program, which we did for the first time this year. Uh, we hired a local teacher who's also a graduate from the journalism program from Michigan State University. Uh, we had eight high school students from the area come and do a two-week intensive. Five of them are still reporters for us, including actually my son. <laughs> and actually also the son of the director of planning for the city, so we have to be careful what we assign um, them. So what do we provide? East Lansing Info uses a Drupal site. I have two tech managers, one of whom volunteers, one of whom is paid. Uh, basically, what we provide is independent, nonpartisan news. We found we have actually had to educate our populace in what independent news means. Um, we sometimes are confused with the city of East Lansing, although the city of East Lansing does not confuse themselves with us. Uh, we provide an improved democratic engagement. By that, what I mean is people now going to the polls actually have voter guides that are nonpartisan voter guides. We ask tough questions. We also make it possible for people to know what's going on in advance of city council or planning commission or the downtown development authority making a decision. And that means they can actually participate in the decision making progress, whereas before they didn't know what was going on. They certainly didn't hear about it until after it was over. So now what we find is that over and over again, letters to city council say, I read in Eli that, Eli is our abbreviation, I read in Eli this and I'm writing to you about this. And the letters are educated, which is really exciting to us. Oh, I know what my third anecdote was gonna be. I had a developer attorney say to me that the reason they were giving us their stuff first before the Lansing State Journal is because we could be trusted to be accurate and what he most hoped for was that the LSJ would plagiarize us because then they would get it right. <laughs> the LSJ has good reporters but they're tremendously underfunded and the consequence is they get they have a hard time doing good work and they get really frustrated so one of the things we love is that we create competition for the LSJ and that forces this Gannett to provide money to the local reporters that work for the LSJ and we love that every time the LSJ does a great story that's accurate we send it out because we feel it's important that we reward them for getting good work done but they are under resourced all over the place and that becomes a real problem we do media literacy from the ground up. This is not something I intended when I founded this organization, but it's been amazing as an effect. What it's done, because we engage people to be reporters, they learn what reporters do. They learn the difference between news and commentary. They learn what it means to have a lead that's a misleading lead or a lead that's an honest lead. They figure out how you source things. They are actually learning how news works, and that means that they grow respect at an amazing level. One thing that's happened is they now understand why news costs money. Before we started, they would say to me, news should always be free. And I would say, the production of news cannot be free. And now they understand why it is that news costs money. Because when they do the work for us, it's hard. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of research. So their level of appreciation for good news has gone up. In fact, many of them tell me they started donating and subscribing to other news organizations because they understood what they were doing with us. And that, to me, is super exciting. We've created in our town a desire for real investigative nonpartisan news. What they've, people in town have told us is they didn't realize they wanted this. But now that they have it, they recognize they really want it. So what does East Lansing look like? Technically, the census says we have a population of 50,000. In reality, 19,600 of us live there year round. It is the home of Michigan State University, which is gigantic compared to us. It is a one-party political town. That is to say, it is blue. We don't do any satire, which it, my husband gets very annoyed. Um, <laughs> 
because he wants to write satire for us. He does astronomy reporting for us and nature reporting. He's a physician, but he does nature and astronomy <laughs> reporting for us. And uh, he, did, he did write a bunch of headlines for an April 1st issue, which we didn't use, but my favorite of his was, last Republican in East Lansing captured, tagged, and moved to safe breeding population. <laughs> We have a city council government. We have public schools with a school board that is elected. We have a $200 million debt and a looming budget crisis. We are about to get hit with our pension problem and we're about to run out of money. So we're talking about having to reduce our um, emergency services by 10 to 30% if we don't pass an income tax on the November 7th ballot. Um, there is no other dedicated news organization in the city dedicated to city reporting. And now other organizations are paying more attention, but it's still not the case that there's anybody else that does exclusively East Lansing reporting. We consistently do city council reporting and consistently do school board reporting, and that is our bread and butter. People pay us money just to do that because they say there's no other way for them to keep track of what's going on at our school board and our city council. So Eli, as I mentioned, was first born as a non economic model in 2012, a cooperative, a news cooperative with no money. I just paid for the website, but there was no money. Reborn as a 501c3 nonprofit in 2014. If any of you are interested in becoming 501c3 nonprofits, I'm happy to share our IRS application, which was highly successful. It was approved in a matter of weeks, and I'm very happy to share that so you can crib from it. Um, we have had, as I mentioned, over 100 citizen reporters. A handful of those are professional journalists. We have actually a night professor who's retired now from MSU who writes for us sometimes. Um, I have people who've been trained at the MSU School of Journalism, but most of the folks who work with us are actually just citizens who are taught how to do basic news reporting. We have a core reporting team of about eight of us that is pretty steadily on work. My managing editor, Ann Nichols, um, works, as I mentioned, is paid and works day to day. I also um, work day to day. Anne is actually a JD. She is also not a professional reporter, but she comes out of a tradition that highly valued news in her family. Her father was a reporter. So she and I work together. It's awesome to have your managing editor be a JD, because the defamation stuff, Anne handles all of that for me. Um, we have had over 500 donors. We operate on only $50,000 a year annually right now. I'm actually going to ask my people for $75,000 this year. We have an advantage in that we can basically turn off the website until they give us enough money to get through the next year, and I'm willing to do that. I have no shame about turning off the website until they pony up enough money to get me through the next year. Because before I did that, I was constantly trying to get more money and not being able to report or reporting and not being able to get money, and I got tired of that. So last year we started a sustainability system where at the end of the year we say, this is how much money we need and we shut off if we don't get it and then we get the money so we hold it hostage it works they have to have us it totally works you we know what do. that did do. yeah i know yeah. we know what what happened with that actually is it caused people who love us to go out and become fundraisers for us which i did not expect but was completely awesome so what has our impact been just to just to wrap up uh, a desire, as I mentioned, for local news, um, open praise, trust, and reliance on Eli that has been tremendous, especially in the last six months. Uh, politicians have to talk to us now. They used to think they could ignore us. They now know they cannot ignore us. They have to call my reporters back. There's a carrot and stick approach. The East Lansing Police Department has been doing policy developments on controversial issue, but it's known that we're going to report on it. So they've engaged the community right from the start and engaged us in keeping people informed. We've gotten Gannett, as I mentioned, to pay for more local journalists, as far as I can tell, because it seems like we've got more resources now. We're teaching citizens how to think about news and also government. We're teaching citizens how to FOIA. My FOIA clerk at the city told me it's, she gets a lot more FOIAs now. Um, we have a highly educated audience because we do short, fewer articles but longer form and more in depth. So we don't expect a lot of time from our readers. We try to not waste their time. So we do in-depth articles, but we ask them to stick with us. And then we have accountability in our town. So what I would say is professional armies are always better, but in times of revolution, sometimes you need a militia. And that's what we are. We're a militia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK, um, we're going to we're gonna have to forego questions, I think, on the next, on the next couple. I'm sorry. We're way behind. But please. Alice, you be around. Sure. Please uh, approach Alice afterwards. Um, that was inspiring. And so, uh, well, I'd like to welcome up Heather Bryant. Um, yeah. And so, Heather is going to be. Is your breakout session today? Yes, it is. Okay. So Heather's going to be involved in a breakout session a little bit later today um, about um, the Knight Fellowship that she did on collaboration 
uh, between news organizations and between news organizations and others. Stephanie Murray is going to be joining her, joining her, not her yet. Um, so please do that. Um, join that. Uh, but Heather uh, is going to talk about something that she wrote a little uh, column. Um, it was a big column, actually, because it got a big response. A little column. A little column. Um, uh, it was a couple months ago. Uh, and I'm going to let her explain what it is, but it got a ton of reaction, and so we thought that the conversation deserved more airing, and so here we go. Thank you very much. Um, hello. So yes, I am. Hi. Uh, I am Heather Bryant, and I'm here because, yeah, a few months ago, I wrote a small post about my husband and my frustrations with my own industry, and it sort of blew up, which is a weird feeling when what I published was essentially an early morning rant with most of the snark taken out of it. Um, and in the post, I, I shared an example of a weird interaction with another journalist at a conference in which they were very put off by my husband's occupation, which is currently as a trash truck driver. Sorry, I just got very echoey. Um, and this isn't the first... I did read that. I read that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and this isn't the first or the only time something like that has happened. It's been enough that in the past he started asking me, how do I introduce myself to your coworkers? And afterwards asking me things like, did I talk too much? Did I sound stupid? He gets anxious about the idea of someone I work with judging me because of what he does for a living. And the fact that he's been given reason to feel that way infuriates me. And what makes it worse is that this only is a problem because it's about me. He worries about how it affects me. Otherwise he doesn't really care about what people think about him. So I wrote and I edited, I called him, asked him if he minded if I published something about him, double checked a couple things, asked him to send me a photo to run with the posts because visuals matter and I'm always a journalist. And he's quite delighted with himself that he managed to take that photo of his own hands with his phone wedged between his chin and his chest. He's actually a very skilled photographer in his own right. And within a day it had more than 18,000 views and by the end of the month it was 60,000 and responses started pouring in. And the trolls showed up thanks to Breitbart. Um, my husband got a kick out of the people, mistaken in thinking that our rural background and his blue collar job meant that he was on their side and he was just this poor guy with this evil elitist wife that hated him and his job. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my roughneck truck driving mechanic husband who bakes and loves Pinterest and is really excited about being a stay at home dad someday and is super proud of me has no time for other people's gender or culture stereotypes. He's, he's living his best life. Um, but I also started getting comments and messages from reporters in newsrooms of every size and freelancers and people who had left the business and people who had family in the business and people who were similarly in these sort of mixed match marriages of occupations. And I heard from people who freelance and said that they learned to not tell anyone that they worked side jobs in retail or service industries to make ends meet. Or people who were now employed as journalists but had other jobs first would tell me stories about learning to not tell coworkers that they used to work in a manual labor job because the way their coworkers treat them would change. And I got messages about editors who straight up told applicants they would never hire someone who had not had an internship or two internships first. And I'm constantly hearing from local journalists who struggle to get attention from their story, for their stories and are treated like fixers by national reporters parachuting in or they're ignored entirely. And the stories have just kept coming in. Journalism cannot survive like this. And if it does, it won't be the kind of journalism that we need. Newsrooms are inherently powerful by nature of what we do, no matter our size or our resources, and we cannot be ignorant of our privilege. We use the word light a lot when we talk about our work. You know, journalism is meant to shine a light on matters important to people and how they make choices and navigate their lives. And the challenge that we have is that we're an industry where only certain people traditionally got to hold the flashlights and pointed them at the shadows that they knew about. Our work is meant to be, you know, emergency flares shot into the sky when we see things that are not right. But we're not everywhere, and there are fewer and fewer of us every day, and if we continue to be exclusive about who gets to hold the flashlights and whose flares we take seriously, we will keep missing important stories. We need to be less like flashlights and a bit more like lighthouses and shine for everybody. Our lessening sense of perspective about what the real world is like for most people is damaging our credibility and our access and the quality of our journalism. And one of the most telling comments that I got after publishing was this. I've never seen anything like this in my newsroom. There's no class problem. You're just starting trouble and picking on your colleagues. <laughs> and I was kind of impressed that they managed to write that without recognizing the cliche of, well, I've never seen X, so it doesn't exist. 
<laughs> so I've started, started doing some research into what the data looks like in addition to all of these anecdotes that I've gotten. And there's not much out there because most socioeconomic research uses occupation as an indicator and it usually doesn't go to within an industry. But what we do know is this, nearly 90% of journalists have college degrees versus 25% of the overall adult population. The median age of journalists has increased much faster than the typical American. The jobs are concentrating in major metro areas, local organizations are struggling. In about 10 years of major journalism conferences, more than 30 states have never hosted one of them. And as of three days ago, you don't even have to be in a community to call yourself local. And when we look at what's published, what do we see? Headlines that talk about the effects of policies on the poor. As someone who grew up as intensely poor, that's not what we called ourselves and most people don't. Who's that headline really for? We see stories that lump various groups into monolithic blocks like gun owners and farmers and working class and play to stereotypes. And we've all experienced the culture and you know, even perpetuated it ourselves where audiences are talked down to and about, commenters are called idiots and journalists don't hesitate to tweet 140 character think pieces about how people don't care about real news anymore. If we're going to be faithful to the duty of our profession when economic inequality is greater than ever and the issues of race and gender and politics are really at the front of everyone's mind, we have to do better. The popular pipeline of J school to internship to newsroom is not mandatory. We can stop pattern matching mistakes of hiring people of a certain background and skill set. Organizations like mine and conferences like this are essential and important in encouraging and empower local news from a lot of different people and we have to build and grow spaces like this and invite people in. And so for the next part of the story, I'm digging into some research about our industry and about us. How well do we reflect and share the common experiences of people we cover? I'm working on a survey that is currently being uh, peer reviewed and if you're interested in helping, I'd love to hear from you and I'll be sharing that pretty far and wide. Let's figure out what we're missing and what we're not and be open with our audiences about it because the distrust that we're facing is not always without cause. Uh, journalism and truck driving actually have a lot in common. Uh, many companies will not hire a driver until they have a set number of hours behind the wheel. So how are you ever supposed to get a job? You have to keep applying and keep applying until you find that special company that actually cares about investing in their people or the desperate ones that will hire you and drop you as soon as it's convenient for them. And that can't be our newsrooms. When it comes to flashlights, I, I know a lot of us only have the budgets to buy matches and others get the bat signal. Um, but none of us can afford to perpetuate you know, practices that are causing all of us harm, especially our audiences. And so the wonderful thing about much of what we do is that it is a process, and process is teachable. Objectivity is a process, it's not a state that you achieve. Investigation is a process. Technical skills are not innate characteristics, despite what Silicon Valley wants people to think. And journalism is an identity that a lot of us hold dear, but it is also a process. So in addition to the survey, I'm working with a few folks to collect as many guides and resources and materials that we can to kind of create an open source journalism curriculum that will be structured in a way that small teams and organizations and individuals can sort of organize together and teach each other and have best practices for that, including like slides and code examples and case studies and everything so that we can do that sort of self-teaching. And I'd say, you know, hire for people and resum not resumes, hire for decency and teamwork, hire for humble curiosity and dogged persistence, and hire for diverse backgrounds and varied life experiences. And when you cannot hire, please collaborate with each other. Thank you. So, um, I, uh, just like, uh, just like uh, knowing Jim Brady from, from years ago. Um, I first met Ebony Reed when she was working for the Associated Press. She is with uh, Reynolds Journalism Institute now, has written a lot recently um, about things that really resonate with Lion publishers, uh, including um, this transition that many of us have made from journalism to selling advertising, right? Or to raising revenue. Um, and so she's gonna talk about that later as soon as she gets her appointment. Hi everybody, good afternoon, thank you Matt. Um, first I wanna say I'm not advocating that journalists become uh, salespeople, which is actually what happened to me. I just wanna share some of my um, experience, um, knowledge and conversations I've had with people that I hope will be helpful to you in um, creating revenue streams and trying to create strong local media um, web products 
and websites for your news consumers. Um, I first met Mike, uh, Matt, as he mentioned, when I was at the Associated Press, but my background, I was a reporter at the Plain Dealer in Cleveland um, after graduating from the Missouri School of Journalism. Um, I worked there for seven years, started on the night beat, um, the least desirable, um, beat there and eventually went on um, to become um, an assistant metro editor before I left and went to Detroit and ran um, an online news team at the Detroit News. Um, went to the Associated Press and they said, well, we actually think your real talent is in selling. Um, and so I was moved over to business development, um, to client relations, and then eventually went on and did national business development and sales as the head of um, U.S. local markets biz dev for AP before I went on to run an advertising team with American City Business Journals, um, which does a lot in the event space. So just a little bit about um, where my knowledge um, comes from. So one of the first things I say to my friends when we talk about, you know, revenue and journalists, I say one of the first things I thought about when I made the transition to trying to make revenue was just thinking about all the people I know, you know, all the contacts, all the people I talk to for stories, you know, where are my contacts, where are my base? And I sort of looked at them as my, um, you know, they were my playbook for where I was going to go and figure out, you know, who wanted to advertise um, with me when I was running an advertising team. They were my playbook when I tried to figure out new streams of revenue um, for the Associated Press and different organizations that wanted to license that content. Um, so I just thought maybe a quick speed exercise might be for you just right now to kind of think about um, three businesses that have been advertised with you locally. Just mentally think about that. Um, and then I'm going to come back to that at the end of the presentation. So publishers are facing a really complex digital landscape, as many of you know. Um, you know, online news audiences are continuing to grow. Um, this is a, a slide that comes from a Pew Research Center this past August, and it shows that the, um, the divide between those that are getting their news on television and getting their news online has actually seen one of the um, steepest sort of like, you know, de declines in television in recent times. And so when we extrapolate this line out by 2019, no surprise there, um, online will surpass um, television. And of course we know that a lot of the new digital dollars you know, in advertising are going to Facebook and are going to Google. Um, we know that Facebook has got the largest market share when it comes um, to mobile. And so what's a publisher to do? And so, you know, my playbook, my thoughts of this come from when I was with the American City Business Journals. And one of the things that I learned there was just the need to have a really um, strong, varied revenue stream. And so, you know, the American City Business Journals, you know, they're in the event space like Billy Penn. Um, you know, they're also doing um, digital ads. They're doing a lot in native. Um, they created a new native hub uh, this year to try to get advertisers in that space. Um, we know from Media Radar earlier this year that there's been a 12% decline in programmatic and a 75% growth in buying for native. So um, I think about changing um, one's business style. You know, I think about um, traditional divisions that I've seen inside of organizations, which I know doesn't necessarily apply to all of you because some of you wear two hats. Some of you are reporter by evening um, or assisting that team, and then by night you're building, you know, the revenue or vice versa. Um, but, but one of the things that has surprised me, even in some small and medium-sized organizations, is that there still is this strong division between the two teams. And so one of the things that I encourage companies to think about, small and large, is sort of how you can build a very ethical system where you have that free flow of conversation you know, and ideas. My boyfriend and I like to argue about this from time to time. He's a working journalist and he feels very much and has for a long time believed in sort of like the division of church and state. And as a person that's worked on both sides of the, of the house, as a person who is a father that was retired from the advertising industry, you know, I feel like that there can be very ethical collaboration. I believe in joint team meetings. I believe in, um, you know, looking forward and thinking about um, new products and services as a team. And, you know, so that's my collaboration is, is key. And I also think that some of the jobs for the future for, for media salespeople, I actually think that they will be the combo jobs of news and product. I don't think that those jobs in the future will continue to stand alone. So that's part of the reason that I um, push and sort of like drive for collaboration between the departments. 
Um, some of my most successful sales calls, um, sometimes it surprises people, sometimes it doesn't, but it was when I actually had a member of the news team to go with me. Um, and that might be surprising to people, but we actually did collaborate. Um, when I was at the Associated Press, when I was at American City Business Journals, if I had a big client to go visit or a big prospect, I would turn to the news side and I would say, would you be willing to go on this call with me and this is why? Um, and I don't think that any of my colleagues not to speak for them, but I never got any pushback or feeling of, oh, my you know, ethics have been compromised for joining Ebony um, on a sales call. Um, earlier this summer, I wrote a piece for Porner, and it's still out there um, online if anybody wants to, um, to read it. But basically, uh, I had a kind of like a tip sheet, and I said, if you're new to media sales, if you're in an organization where you're being encouraged to um, make revenue or you're trying to transition into that space, um, I gave eight bullet points um, sort of like to be a helpful tip guide. They're things that I wish I had known when I made that transition. Um, and some of those, you know, include, you know, learning how to communicate with business people. Um, I find that their emails are a lot shorter and snappier to the point um, than what I was accustomed to in some of my communications prior to moving into sales. Um, learning the products in a way that not only could I help make the sale, but also I could help them if they had quick questions. That was really important. And so that tip sheet is out there um, if it's helpful. Um, I also think it's important to embrace future trends. I was just at ONA last week um, as the Director of Innovation in the Futures Lab at RJI, and you know, there's a lot of talk about voice-activated technology, artificial intelligence, and how that will change the landscape in 10 years. Some people think that those things will happen. Some people think that maybe not everything that the futurists think will happen will happen. Um, at the conference, some people talked about, Amy Webb specifically, about us being in the final days of the smartphone. And so uh, what does that mean and where are we headed? A lot of people think that we're headed to a lot of voice control technology with the smart devices in our homes, and that's ultimately where we'll be in 10 years. And so I would just simply encourage you, as she encouraged a lot of the journalists at that conference, is to be thinking about that technology because right now there are very few um, media companies, news companies, that have figured out how to monetize on those devices. And so is it a podcast or is it something that none of us even have seen or heard before? Um, you know, that's, that's highly possible. So your challenge from here, you know, um, those circling back to those companies that you thought about that have not, you know, advertised, supported, sponsored, partnered with your media company, sort of like, where do you go from here? Um, you know, one of the suggestions that I would have is if you have someone in mind that hasn't supported your local media, if you can get in the door and have a conversation with them and just simply go in and do what we call an informational interview and just find out about the direction of their company, the direction of their marketing, if they'll share it, and then see um, where there may be some intersections um, with the work that you're doing. And then if you're successful, if we're all successful, the reign of revenue will fall in local media. So we've caught up. So if any of you have any questions for Alice or for Heather or for Ebony, we have a little bit of time. If they're willing. Hi, um, I'm a reporter with Richardson Source. My name is Noah Jones. I was just interested in knowing what exactly it was that you were bringing your uh, editors or people from editorial along with you specifically for, um, in terms of like, was it for sponsored content and they were trying to figure out a certain type of way to cover what they were interested in or like if they thought that what they were selling would look good on the economic business sure. page or something. So a lot of times, you know, when we, when we go out and we talk to people that are not journalists, this whole um, invisible divide that we have to, you know, to basically protect you know, news integrity, they don't see that division. They just see us as one company. So sometimes it was people simply saying, well, I like to know the priorities of the news you know, team. I like to know like, how are they comprised? How many people are covering what in your operation? Um, you know, are there big sort of like initiatives coming up? Like they were very kind of just like general you know, questions that you might get from like a, a reader representative meeting but for these companies they felt special they felt like wow like not only did Ebony come here to like ask us for more money but she brought a colleague that could answer some news questions I never had a situation where they said can we get this story in or where they tried to influence 
um, the coverage. Brad Dickerson, Oklahoma City Free Press. Um, what what did you talk about? You know, you you didn't talk about you know you talk about bringing a reporter with you from the news side. What 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 did you actually talk about? Because so, because we have some publications in our city that are kind of infamous for saying if you buy this size ad, that's that's one story. If you buy this size ad, that's two stories. And hard, hardly anybody considers them to be a credible source at all. So, so that looks, what you're describing there looks amazingly similar to, to just, you know, what a lot of us think of as just ad platforms uh, yeah. where, so, where, where you can't really trust what's, what's being said there. So my team at American City Business Journal, at the Boston Business Journal, we didn't just sell digital advertising, but we also sold corporate sponsorships for events. So the events business is a million dollar business per city in all 43 cities for ACBJ. So when we would go and we would talk to clients, we would be saying, well, what are your marketing initiatives? You know, we have a digital platform. We have newsletters that come out out to three times a week. We don't sell those based on how many have subscribed. We always sold it based on sponsorship and positioning and it was based on the value of the newsletter. So it was based on, this is the news that's in there, this is the news we're breaking, this is the value of it to the community, to the business community. Um, do you want to position your brand next to it? So it was conversations along that, and then the person that we're sitting with might say, well, you know, I have some questions about how this story came together, or questions about how the news team is, you know, organized. And then that's where a colleague from news... That's what your business people are asking? Some of the business people, yes, sir. They did ask that very frequently because to how, them, how how is the news team organized? They were That's very what they were very interested, and I don't think it was sort of like that they were trying to get a, some sort of extra special treatment. But to them, they some of them had never been inside of a news organization, I see. so they were just curious. They were just trying to like understand, you know, like what is the process um, for that. And so for me, it was very helpful because it could be easy for me as a former journalist to just put on that hat and answer their questions, right? <laughs> but I wanted to stay in my lane at that moment. And so I kind of equated that work that I was doing at that time to basically being on a baseball team. Like I knew my position, I knew what I had to play, and then I needed my colleagues who were in other positions to come with me sometimes and support the work. And so some of the largest clients that my team sold six-figure accounts, it was because I went and the editor went in collaboration with me, and we had this holistic conversation. I mean, when we showed up to talk to people, nobody really wants to feel like you're just coming to say, give me your money, right? You know, or just what is that ad you want, or what's that event you want us to do for us? Like, they really want to feel that they're a partner, and not so much partner of we're trying to influence the news coverage, but just that we understand and how your organization works. They wanted to be able to talk intelligently to their colleagues and their bosses about what our operation did. And absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry I wasn't clear about that earlier. I think I was a little nervous. Like I was like, speed, speed through seven minutes. I didn't want Matt to give me the hands. <laughs> So I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, I just wanted to give a shout out to Heather. I think we always complain about race and gender and regions, but, but class is also one of those big issues and journalists don't want to deal with that in their newsrooms and how it affects how they cover news. So, so I'm liking that, thank you. Um, I just had a question uh, for Alice, if Alice is still here. And this just has to do with the media literacy Thing you were talking about, and you talked about the fact that you were teaching folks how to do FOIAs, but what else do you, I mean, what other training, me. I'm over oh, here, thank you. what other training do you provide before, you know, the citizen reporters go to meetings? How it's, do you prepare people yeah, to actually cover Yeah, it depends on their stuff? level of understanding, and so um, one of the, it, it, we really vary, we're working one-on-one -on -one with them, so either Ann or I typically are working one-on-one -on -one with somebody who is new, or somebody even who's been around a while. And we're working with them on the way the story is going to shape up, what kinds of things they need to keep in mind, who they need to be talking to, and what kinds of things they need to include, and basically the way the format should look as the story is developing. So we're doing, with somebody who's inexperienced, we're doing pretty intensive back and forth. With somebody who's more experienced, they need a lot less back and forth. So it really depends on the individual. It does sometimes happen that we hit somebody that we think is going to be fine, and it turns out they're not fine. 
and we will occasionally pay a kill fee, which we educate them then what a kill fee is, <laughs> and tell them we can't publish it because it's not up to standards, because we've been back and forth too many times and it's still not up to our standards. We will not publish stuff out of charity. So even if it's a great story and it's a lovely human being and it's a neighbor, we won't publish it if it's not up to the standards because we've found that we have to keep the standards really high. So it depends on the individuals. The students, for example, the high school students did this two-week intensive, but of course two weeks is not really enough to be a serious reporter, so I'm continuing to work with them one-on-one -on -one as they develop stories. So for example, two of the high school reporters, um, one of whom happens to be my son, recently did a ride-along with the police during a big MSU game night to show the stress on the city and stress on the police department, and I worked with them pretty closely about what kinds of things are you going to be looking for. The police were also awesome about working with them, talking to them about what are you allowed to say, what are you not allowed to say in terms of not revealing people's stuff that shouldn't be revealed. Um, as they do the ride-along. So it really depends on the individuals, and we work with them pretty closely. And a lot of them have really bloomed. They've really gotten into it and gotten really excited about being reporters um, and have taken it very seriously. So they're, they're pretty happy to have assignments from us now. The other thing that happens, of course, is people come to us with story ideas all the time. So we also run a service called Ask Eli to Investigate. People can send us a tip or a question and they, they're typically in the forms of questions, can we find out the answer to this, can you find out the answer to this? If we think it's something that more than one reader will be interested in, we'll do that with them. But often we say to the person, well, you're asking this question because you know something, and can we have you be the reporter? So if somebody's asking the question, how high do we rank in the um, level of most property taxes in the state? The answer happens to be East Lansing is number four, number five in the state in terms of height of property taxes. You know, when somebody came to us with that, we said to him, well, you seem to know this stuff. Could we get you to do the data crunching for us and do the reporting? So that's part of what we're doing is as people come to us with ideas and come to us as questions, we're turning them into reporters. I have a question for Ebony. Uh, so in one of your slides, you talked about developing salespeople internally. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, what you might look for from the people already working for you that might make for a good salesperson, how you go about developing them, and what are some of the, what are some of the traits that separates the people who work out versus the people who do not? Well, that's a really great question because um, when the AP said to me in 2010, <clears throat> excuse me, 90 days after I was hired, that I would make a great salesperson, they actually transitioned all of their bureau chiefs at that time um, toward making them local directors, making them salespeople. And so now when I look back at that inaugural class of us that became salespeople overnight, about half of them are still at the AP and the other half are out doing other things. And so I think for those that made really good salespeople, um, you know, they were very organized. I mean, because when you think about, um, you know, prospecting and building prospecting lists, it's kind of like how you build the list of people that you're gonna to talk to for a story, but for sales, you're like populating this pipeline and you're having to follow up. So these had to be people that, you know, basically loved talking to people, connecting, but these had to be people that could ask consultative questions and basically, you know, qu pretty quickly like zero in on what is the pain point of the potential sponsor, marketer, or advertiser, like what are they trying to do? Um, also, these had to be people that weren't afraid to hear no. I mean, you know, you would think as a journalist that we're all very comfortable with being told no, but it's on a whole nother level on the sales side. I mean, like, I could go like, I could go like weeks <laughs> with people telling me, no, you're a lovely, you're a very nice young woman is what they would say, but I, I won't be buying your service. Um, so I think that the, the people that were successful had to get really comfortable with that no and had to know that it wasn't personal, it didn't mean anything about their quality or their um, self-esteem as like a professional, like they had to be really good with that. And then they also had to be forward thinking. So they had to be thinking, okay, I'm selling this today, but what am I gonna be selling tomorrow? And so, you know, what am I doing to basically get ready for that? What solution am I offering? Am I asking the right questions when I'm meeting with people to get to like what they're trying to do internally in terms of marketing for tomorrow? And then the last thing I would say is to look for continuous training. And that's really hard, right? Because like it's hard enough to find training to be like a great reporter but it's even harder to find really great training to be a good salesperson and some colleges and universities have classes some of them don't I went to school and got a real estate license I saw a Groupon and it was like 150 bucks and I thought well you know what like 
they must teach them in school like how to sell. And I just kind of want to know like their philosophies, like how they think, how they train them. And I went to school for that and that also, you know, sort of helped me. Um, and then, oh, I said that was the last thing, but actually just one more thing. Um, and to be really comfortable with having to meet a quota. Um, every place I worked where I was doing sales, like I had to meet my number. And there were times that I didn't, but most of the time I did. So they have to be people that are really comfortable with like trying to hit that number and figuring out creative strategies when they're looking like they're coming up short that are ethical. I just want to All right, that. thank you, Alice, Heather, Jim, Ebony. So um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, so you have some difficult choices ahead. So we have a break for about 20 minutes and then we have four breakout sessions happening at once. Um, we have nonprofit fundraising, we'll be right in here. Um, we have a really good, she's a really good speaker. Kim Bowie is gonna do a talk on all the platforms that you're too afraid to tackle, Instagram, Snapchat, and just the mindset around trying new things and why you should be there. Um, that's in B. In A, we're gonna have um, the Lion sites that have been part of the Facebook partnership. Um, and so you can learn all about what that's about and, and what lessons that they've had. Stephanie Murray from the Center for Cooperative Media who's been spearheading that. David Beard from Shorenstein Center who's been working on that as well. We'll be there along with the Lion members. That's an A. And then last but not least, especially if you want to make money, is monetizing email newsletters in Room C. We're videotaping these. We're videotaping these and they will be posted at some point. Yes. 